himself to the Center for Ethics, Law, and Society at Sonoma State lecture series, and um, I'm going to be giving uh, a talk on uh, uh, robotic uh, surgery and uh, ethical issues that arise in um, in that world. So, um, so this is uh, this is based on uh, some work that I've I've been following uh, robotic surgery for for about five years or so now, and uh, uh, I wrote a paper early on in that process, which a lot of this is based on, and it's one of my, um, it's my second highest uh, cited paper. It gets read all the time, and, um, uh, and it's one of the very first uh, uh, papers written on the ethics of, um, of uh, uh, robotic surgery. Uh, so it's kind of interesting, but of course everything changes with a topic like this. The technology for robotic surgery is uh, just growing in leaps and bounds. And uh, this particular machine right here is actually not the, uh, not the machine that you'll see on uh, operating floors as much uh, now. Um, uh, why uh, I'm, I'm getting back into this topic is um, over the uh, winter break, I have to have a surgery done by this particular machine. And um, so, of course, uh, being um, involved in um, surgery like that is an uh, emotional and, um, and uh, frightening sort of thing. And it was really comforting to have had this paper that I wrote four years earlier, so my, my rational, common rational self could talk to my uh, current, more emotional self. And um, and uh, and I could make some some better better decisions about how to go forward on this. So I thought it might be useful for some of you because uh, the truth of the matter is, as we go forward, um, if you find yourself in need of uh, surgery in the future, it's probably going to be uh, have something to do with this kind of technology. Um, so let's take a look at what it's all about. So we have here. Um, uh, this first uh, robotic surgery uh, device was approved in um, 2000 by the FDA, and um, by 2013, the, the time that I wrote this paper originally, there had been 367 surgical procedures, and it, already by that point, um, there was 105 million worldwide, and 27% of all hysterectomies are done with this machine, and 87% of all prostatectomies, that's a hard word to say, um, are, were done by that machine. It's closer to 99% now. Um, so this is uh, some new facts as of just uh, last month. Um, so at this particular time, there's, uh, there's um, 107, I mean, sorry, one, 1,700 of these uh, machines installed in hospitals around the world, uh, 775 patients worldwide, have had this uh, procedure done in the last year, uh, I mean, up to the last year. Um, so you can see it's, it's it, since 2013, it's, it's sort of doubled in the number, um, and it took 13 years to get up to 300,000, and now it's, it's doubled in, um, in this time. Um, three out of four prostate cancer surgeries are done by this uh, Da Vinci surgery machine. Uh, more men choose this for prostate cancer than any other treatment. It's got a, a pretty good rate of success with that treatment. Women are using it for hysterectomies and other um, uh, surgeries that require um, dexterity. And, um, uh, and it seems like there's a, there's a better, better chance of success when you remove the prostate with, uh, with this machine than with um, uh, radiation treatment. Um, but there's also problems with this machine. So what are, what are some of the issues? And um, uh, this, this is what we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about. So um, do we, do we um, are there particular costs in, when it comes to safety? There's definitely money costs. So uh, as we'll see in a moment, uh, these uh, surgeries are much more uh, costly to do. Uh, you can see how it works here is these are the surgeons right here, and they're looking in kind of a virtual reality glasses, right? And uh, so they see this stuff in kind of a 3D view. And uh, this is the patient right here. 
and then there will be a nurse monitoring what's going on with the machine, and then some other technicians uh, watching up on the video to make sure things don't go wrong. Things do go wrong in this in this kind of sur surgery. Um, so there's uh, the machine itself isn't uh, foolproof at this particular time because it's still kind of new. Uh, so we're going to have to ask ourselves: Are engineer, or, or sorry, injuries and other kind of engineering problems uh, being reported correctly? Um, is there uh, what we'll be primarily interested in here is, is some of the, the the different breach of trust that we have with uh, surgeons? How does robots uh, enhance our our getting away of that? And then we'll talk a little bit about reverse adaptation, which is when we change society to fit a technology rather than changing the technology to fit <coughs> our society. Uh, so this is a new new slide, a couple new slides too, just a very recent um, uh, report. So we have a couple of doctors here who have done some studies about robotic surgery, the risks and rewards of it. Uh, they are telling us that um, this is rapidly expanding. Any hospital you go into, if, you're, if you, any of you guys are getting involved in the medical world in any way, you're going to run into this technology. It's growing uh, really quickly. Um, it's, um, it's definitely showing some uh, interesting short-term benefits, um, it's, um, uh, but it has um, uh, usually, depending on what we're talking about, similar long-term effects. So uh, one of the main benefits of robotic surgery right now is uh, decreased time, uh, recovery time in the hospital. So what they can do instead of, instead of having to really open you up so that you can get human hands in there to mess around with the organs that, that we're working with, um, all they have to do is this, this tiny little incision and the robotic arms go in and then they spread out and they, move, they, they, they work inside you like a spider, right? And yeah, like spider legs. And so that means that the incision in your body that to get inside is much smaller and they of course, heals faster, right? So, um, so you spend less time in the hospital. It's, it's kind of odd. You'll spend more time on the table than with a, a open surgery. Um, but you'll, uh, so, so the robotic surgery actually takes longer, um, but, you, but you will spend less time in recovery in the hospital. Um, but long-term effects, it's probably a wash as to whether you had open surgery or robotic surgery as to which, uh, which one was better. So it's a, it's a complicated story, right? Um, so that means that there are some areas for improvement. Um, so there's some uh, uh, reduction. We need to reduce the error in robotic surgery, um, need more standardized training, um, need more training in general if this is the direction that we want to go in is what these doctors are uh, talking about. Uh, Stanford just last month released a uh, big study, a uh, really important, interesting study. Now, what they are looking at is only a particular kind of surgery. So this is uh, for kidney cancer, um, if you're going to remove the entire kidney. Um, so it's really important to pay attention to that when you read this, because it looks kind of bad initially. Um, so uh, they studied from 2003 to 2015, in 416 different hospitals, they watched all the uh, kidney removals that were done with this machine and without this machine, and they noticed that um, that there was uh, no difference in results. So whether a robot did it or, or a human did it in an open surgery, uh, your survival rates weren't increased or decreased. Um, but you did pay, uh, you know, two thousand seven hundred dollars more for the robot. So the robot was was more expensive. Than, um, than the standard surgery. Um, now he says, uh, so so this is a quote from the, the lead uh, author here. Did I put his name up? The name up, here he is. Uh, so Dr. Kim tells us that there is a certain incentive to use very expensive equipment. So imagine you're a hospital administrator and you've bought this really expensive robot. You want to use it, right? Um, but it is also important to be cognizant as to how our health care dollars are being spent. Although robotic surgery has some advantages, uh, are those advantages relevant enough for this type of case to justify an increase in cost? Um, now, really important to, uh, to take this into consideration because uh, this, is, this is basically the surgery that I have to have done. So I was, I was particularly worried about this when I read this. Uh, but 
Um, on closer look, I notice that um, uh, what what they're talking about is the removal of the entire kidney. Now, if you if if the sometimes if your cancer is small enough, they just remove a part of the kidney, right? And when they remove a part of the kidney, it turns out that the robot is tons better, right? Tons better than uh, than, than even open surgery. So if you're just going to cut in, take the whole kidney out and then sew them back up, that's one thing. But if you're gonna go in and try to try to actually do surgery on the kidney itself, it turns out that the little tiny robot hands are extremely useful in that, because what they do is they have to scoop it out, and then they have to fold it back together and sew up the, the top of the kidney. Um, so if you're gonna do that, then the robot actually makes sense. So when you're reading studies like this, you have to really pay attention to what we're talking about. He's just talking about one particular kind of surgery in that particular kind of surgery, the robot wasn't very useful, but in other kinds of surgery, maybe it is. Okay, so here's some of the issues to think about when uh, we're talking about adding robots to the, the medical, medical world. Um, this is a really interesting, uh, when I did this research, I had no idea that this was, this was uh, even a, a concern, but it is a concern. As we move to uh, robotic surgery, our surgeons, like if you're, if you're going into medical school now and you, and you go down the, the direction of being a, sur a surgeon, especially if you're gonna get into urology, you're gonna learn robotic surgery. That's the, that's the, the, the thing that you're gonna learn. You're gonna, you're gonna come up um, in, in that world and you're gonna do a little bit of open surgery, but not, it's not gonna be your specialty. Um, now, that means that, that doctors your age, as they, as they go forward, are going, to be, are going to be thinking in that world. But now if you are a surgeon in uh, other parts of the world where we don't have you know, the, the greatest hospitals, um, these patients, right, what kind of surgery do, are they going to have offered to them? They're going to have only, their only choice is open surgery. Now here's an interesting thing that I didn't really realize is that um, doctors from the Western world um, uh, develop new techniques and those new techniques then find their ways over into uh, hospitals like this. But if you guys are being trained only on robots, machines that are super expensive that these hospitals are never gonna be able to afford, then what you learn will not be transferable to the third world, right? So, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll basically be splitting off, right, as, as two distinct human species, right? One that's very robot oriented and one that isn't. Um, so, we have to ask ourselves, are we, are we, are we setting ourselves up? It's, it's kind of an ethical question, right? Are we, doing, are we doing the best that we can for all the people in the world? We're certainly doing the best we can for ourselves, but does that translate to being uh, useful to other people in the world? Okay, so that brings us into the interesting world of surgery ethics, which um, uh, I found out, to my surprise, um, Medical ethics is, is a big topic. It's been a topic forever. Um, but as it turns out, uh, surgery ethics is only about 20 years old. So people have only been talking about the ethics of surgery for uh, less than 20 years, which is odd because um, this is ancient surgery, right? And this is semi-modern surgery. Um, it, it seems like it has effects that ethicists should have been paying attention to. but. Um, up to 20 years ago, surgeons thought that surgery ethics was kind of an oxymoron, a, a word that made no sense. Um, but that's been changing, and there has been um, a, a growing uh, uh, new world of uh, surgery ethics. And so what I tried to do was try to apply robotics to the existing world of uh, surgery ethics. Okay, so um, people who study this and um, are worried about the ethics of surgery have uh, identified um, uh, four or so things that are, that are not just medical ethics, right? They, they're specific to surgeons. And what's specific to surgeons is this, uh, is this fact that they are super physically intimate with you, more so than your regular doctor. They are literally inside your body, right? They open you up and they are inside your body. So they are the most intimate, uh, person that you will ever be in, in, encounter in, in your life, because they are going to be, they're going to know everything about you, right, in, in intense detail. But the, the, 
the other odd thing about it is this relationship, while extremely intimate, is extremely fast. So surgeons just deal with you as a patient really quick, and then they're on to the next patient, the next patient, the next patient. It's like an assembly line. So um, they're not like your, uh, your personal doctor, who you might see time and time again over years and years and develop a, a more uh, sort of human relationship. So your relationship with your, with your surgeon is an odd one, right, uh, a strange one. Um, that's, uh, that's intensely intimate, but also intensely fast. Um, other things we have to think about is the informed consent uh, in surgery, which turns out to be an issue because quite often um, uh, they will open you up and they will be looking inside. They meant, to, they meant to be doing one procedure, and then when they open you up, they see some other stuff that needs to work. And it's not like they can just sort of wake you up and say, hey, we're, we want, we've got a, another surgery we want to do with you. Um, do you consent to that, right? So, and then turn you back off, right? They can't do that to you. Um, it would be a, it would be a, an awful uh, experience um, to have that happen. Um, um, I had a, had a friend who had that happen by mistake. He was in a surgery. He starts coming out of it, and he feels like this incredible pain. And the nurse sees his eyes sort of coming to consciousness. And then the only thing he remembers is her turning a, a knob. Right, to give them more gas. <laughs> and so that, so you don't want to wake up in the middle of a surgery, right? It's, it's, uh, it's an awful experience. Um, so we can't wake you up. We can't get informed consent if we want to extend the procedure. So oftentimes surgeons make the call themselves, right? So they're, they, they, uh, they often find themselves in a position where they have to just decide what's best for you without actually having talked to you, right? Um, there's also the problem with industry relationships. So surgeons have a very tight uh, relationship with the industry, especially the robotics industry, because robotics engineers don't know jack about surgery, right? And surgeons don't know anything about robotics. In order for this thing to work, they have to work very closely together. And, um, and that means that surgeons get a little piece of the cut, right, when these machines are built. So. Um, so, so when you go in and your surgeon it says, I totally recommend this robotic procedure, you have to ask yourself, is that because they're getting extra money for doing that? Is it really the best thing for you or is it the best thing for the surgeon? Right. So, um, so industry relationships are going to be a very important thing to think about. And then outcomes reporting. Uh, surgery is all about, uh, has, a, has a lot of intense outcome reporting. And that can actually sort of harm robotic surgery because this is a new technology, of course things are going to be going wrong, and those things get, get uh, reported really quickly, and that might cause us to um, not consider um, uh, robotic surgery in ways that maybe we ought to. So all of this is, uh, is what we're going to try to talk about. So let's talk a little bit about this industry relationship. Um, there's a, a real pro possibility of conflict of interest here. Um, so as I said, right, you need, you need the surgeons to, um, to help the in, with the innovations. The surgeons, of course, like to get involved because they make a little bit of extra money on the side uh, being part of these uh, corporations that are pr uh, producing these things. Even if you're just doing open surgery like this, surgery with a scalpel, if you're a surgeon and you've figured out some new technique that is better than the old technique, you can, you can um, patent that. And, um, and make some money off of that, right? So, so surgery is, has, has always been about, uh, it's, it's, it's a much more technological, um, uh, the doctors are much more directly involved in the technology than in any other form of um, uh, medical practice. So we have to really watch out for conflicts of interest. So when you, if you are in a position where you have to ask, um, you know, where, where you're contemplating robotic surgery, first thing you want to ask is, um, you know, do you have a conflict of interest? How much money are you making on this? Are you involved in the patents of this machine that uh, we're going to use? And make a good informed decision based on that. Um, outcomes reporting turns out to be uh, easier in surgery than any other practice. Um, it's, usually, it's usually directly obvious, right? If, if we're doing a surgery and we cut something incorrectly and that the patient bleeds out and dies, it's pretty obvious that it was the surgeon's fault, right, that, that, that caused that. Um, if you're taking some kind of a medication and 10 years from now you die, was it because of that medication or not, right? That's a, that's a much more difficult uh, uh, cause and effect relationship. Surgery, it's almost always super direct. 
And so surgeons uh, 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 pay for that, literally, out of their pocket sometimes. Um, so this has had, this has currently had a um, negative impact on robotic surgery. Every time a big accident happens, you'll notice that the stock in companies that, um, that are, um, uh, you know, the stock in intuitive surgical, for instance, will drop uh, a lot. Um, probably in the, in the interest of, of ethics, I should probably um, uh, mention that I do own stock in intuitive sur surgical, and I'm not trying to get you to buy it or sell it, um, but, um, but you should know that, that, that I have a small financial interest in this. Okay. Um, so here's some, some of the interesting, uh, uh, you know, game that, um, that surgeons have to play um, that are that some interesting, you know, dilemmas, ethical dilemmas that come up uh, only in, in surgery. We've already talked about the scope of informed consent. Um, the, um, uh, the next thing is do you tell, do you tell the, the, the patient that you left some gauze in them, for instance, and, and before you sewed them up, you realized you forgot to pull the gauze out, and then you, you pulled it out a little bit later in the procedure than you expected to. Um, is that something you're going to disclose to the patient afterward, or are you just going to shake their hands and let them, let them head out the door as if nothing happened? Um, uh, are you going to disclose the fact that quite often uh, these are new people, right? There's a, there's a surgery is a, is a skill that has to be learned by younger surgeons following around older surgeons and learning the skills by watching and doing. Um, for instance, when my, when my wife had a C-section, um, I remember the, the moment was very frightening to us because we, we were dealing with this doctor and then right the day before, he said, oh, I'm gonna add this, this other guy in and it was this young guy, right? It's a you know, new guy and he's like, oh, I'm so excited. It's gonna be my very first surgery. You're like, I'm gonna, we're gonna be your very first surgery. <laughs> But, but that, that, that goes now to the, the ethics of the, of the individual, right, which we also have to talk about. Do you have the ethical right to demand that we not teach this guy, right, on me, right? Because it's me. I don't mind, I don't mind if, we, if he learns on you, right? But I don't want him learning on me, right? But he's got to learn on somebody, right? So, so does, a, does a patient really have the ethical right to demand that learners are not in the room, right? So this is a, this is a constantly complex uh, game that a surgeon has to play. Um, and then we talked about the decisional capacity. Sometimes you have it, um, and so, sometimes you have the luxury of thinking about a surgery for a long time. Other times you don't. Um, so um, uh, one of the people that I was talking to about this kind of surgery that I'm going to be involved with, he had no choice. He walked into his doctor. The doctor said, um, I looked at the scan of him and said, look, you've got like stage four cancer. I'll see you tomorrow morning. And, um, and by the next morning, his kidney was gone, right? So, um, so that guy didn't have any time at all to really think about any of this stuff, right? Uh, had less than 24 hours to, um, to make the decision, these life-changing life decisions. Um, so surgeons put you in those positions. How do they do so in an ethical manner, right? An ethical manner that respects your autonomy, is about beneficence, um, considers non-malfeasance, and um, and uh, considers justice. Uh, for instance, one of the questions they asked me, which was clearly an ethical question, was um, whether or not I wanted, um, if, if they needed to give me a blood transfusion, whether or not they, I wanted them to do that. And I, and I remember when they asked me that question, I'm like, that's so stupid. Like, why wouldn't you, right? Um, of course, give me a blood transfusion. I don't want to die. And, uh, but they said, but, and then I asked her, and, and she said, well, you know, actually, so there are certain religions that just won't do that, right? And so it's kind of a, it's not a technical question. Of course, technically, they want to give you the blood transfusion, and they suggest the blood transfusion, but for uh, religious reasons, some people will um, decide against that and just die, I guess. Okay, so... This, is, this brings up, is a great, great example bringing up this problem of paternalism, right? So as a surgeon, a surgeon may know that your chances of surviving a surgery are a lot higher if you, uh, if you, if you consent to the blood transfusion. Um, but, uh, but do they, 
the, their point of view is always go for the blood transfusion, um, but do they get to uh, boss you around um, or not, right? Um, so paternalism is a, is a big issue with this. Um, respecting a person's particular autonomy. Uh, maybe they just don't want the, maybe they do would prefer to die than um, have some of these uh, procedures done on them. Um, the problem about surrogacy, sometimes the patient is kind of out of, out of um, commission already. Um, an accident has happened, they're unconscious, they're not going to be conscious before the surgery starts. And then who gets to make the decisions about that person? Uh, which relatives, um, um, you know, because you can have situations like this where, where the relative says, no, I don't, think, I don't think Rich Uncle Jim really wants this surgery done. I think he'd rather die and leave his estate to me. Um, so you're going to listen to that surrogate. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem, right? Um, and then beneficence in the proposed procedures. Are you, are you thinking about what's good for the patient and not just what's good for you or good for your hospital or good for society in general? Okay, so we have um, truth-telling is really important, especially when we're in the world of robotic surgery. Like I said, uh, report, report. when you report something uh, bad, uh, people sell off the stock. When you report something good, people uh, uh, buy the stock. So you would see that, at least from the company's point of view, their, their motivation would be to, uh, to uh, really promote the good things about remote robotic surgery and play down the bad things because it, it really uh, uh, affects their bottom line and it can lead to lawsuits and different things like that. Um, so the problem here that these uh, uh, doctors and, um, and other uh, researchers tell us in their paper is that a physician may not conceal or refrain from disclosing a medical error in the hopes of avoiding a lawsuit or unpleasant emotions and embarrassment. So this is an ethical, uh, an ethical decision that surgeons have to make. <clears throat> Sometimes they're trying to protect themselves from a lawsuit. Sometimes they're just embarrassed that they made a mistake. Regardless of that, uh, uh, the uh, uh, ethicists um, in this report suggest that uh, truth telling is always the important in this world of uh, reporting, reporting errors when and how they happen. Okay, we talked a little bit about this already, your decisional capacity as a patient. Are you people, people making good decisions? One thing that um, I noticed um, just in my own experience that I didn't think about when I wrote this paper is, um, is the, uh, when, you, when you're this person, right, um, you're kind of drawing, grasping for straws and, and you'll, you'll do almost anything. Um, so I think you're more susceptible, easier to, um, uh, you're far less skeptical when you're in that position of your doctor than you might be otherwise. Um, so your doctor may be able to cause, influence your decisions in ways that, that, that you might, they might not have influenced your decisions if you were in a, in a, in a less vulnerable state. And then we talked a little bit about this, the unethical qu uh, uh, request by a patient don't have to be honored by the doctor. So um, if the patient is making an unethical uh, request, like I don't want the uh, new the new surgeon involved with me, um, just because I, I I'm worried about myself. That's that that may actually be an unethical request, one that we can ignore. Actually, um, uh, also an unethical request is I want the most expensive, best surgeon uh, possible. Right? Why do you get that and somebody else doesn't? Because their time is limited. Um, we should, uh, we should hope that, that there's a system in place deciding who gets, who gets which surgeons, um, which cases really, really require the best surgeon in the world, and which cases can be delegated down. Okay, so um, here we're, we're talking about, this is the world that I normally work in, is the world of robo-ethics, which is a, an, also a new 20 years or less old um, uh, ethical uh, research area. And um, so what we're looking at here is some of the, um, uh, uh, some of the work from 
robo-ethics and books like this that can be applied to the specific instance of uh, robotic surgery. This is just an, a look at a, an earlier version of the um, robotic surgery machine. They started building these things, uh, researching these things in the 70s, and they're just now starting to um, make it into the, the millions of um, millions of dollars in, in, in uh, profits for, for building these machines and, and uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, uses. Um, so one of the things we have to remember about robotic surgery, which is very different, most of the time innovations in surgery have come from surgeons themselves. This is one of the very first innovations in surgery that's come from outside surgery. It was, it was developed, uh, I was, uh, last summer I was at uh, SRI um, in Stanford, um, a little research uh, R&D think tank, and in there they have one of the very first prototypes of the Da Vinci machine, and they did all the prototyping and, and, and discovery of this stuff. Um, just engineers did this, and then they sold it, and then that company um, decided to try to pull surgeons in and decide if it could be used in um, a profitable way in actual sur surgery. So it wasn't that surgeons came up with this idea of, wow, we really need robots. Instead, it was engineers that said, you guys really need robots. So here's uh, an early uh, case. So it, 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 what we're worried about here is, was surgery uh, robots a solution looking for a problem, right? In the early days, it looks exactly like that's what it was. It was a solution looking for a problem. Wasn't that surgeon said, we have this problem, we really need you guys to help us fix it, and it went the other way around. And so one of the, one of the early things that they were doing was um, they were doing uh, removing thyroid glands. So that's that thing right here, right, on your throat. Uh, can have problems, usually cancer, right? So um, if, if we need to get rid of that thing, how do we do it? Well, it turns out that in an open surgery, they cut your neck, right, and they pull it out, and then what you're left with is this big scar, right, that looks like this on your neck for the rest of your life. Um, but with, um, with the robot, I can't remember where they go in. They go in in a really surprising place. I think it, it might be in your back or somewhere in your arm. And then they go up, and then they, then they remove the, the thyroid, and they pull it back out through the hole, right? So what's really cool about this is that there's no scar, right? You can have your thyroid removed, and you don't look, uh, you don't look any different than you did before. Um, so patients, of course, really, you know, really like this, right, for, for reasons of vanity. Um, as it turned out, though, your chance of survival was greatly increased if you went with the scar, right? turned out that the, the regular open surgery had a huge uh, 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 benefit in survival rate. Um, so, our, were, so what we're worried about is early, like think of, you know, early 2000s, right? Were some people who are dead now, did they make the decision based on something stupid, right, about... about beauty concern, a cosmetic concern, and it, and it wound up costing them their lives. Um, other concerns we have is optimism bias, right? Because um, we're really optimistic about this, uh, these machines, uh, the people who use them and design them, they're, uh, they're really excited about it. And um, um, does, that, does some of that optimism seep into the surgeon who then assumes that the, that the machine is better in this particular instance than it might actually be. It has a very steep learning curve. Um, what that Stanford study, one of the things they said to think about was, um, was the results spoke for themselves. The results were that it was just more expensive and, um, and, it seemed, and, it, and it's mostly more expensive because it takes more time to do the surgeries than it would an open surgery is, uh, is much faster than, than doing all this fiddly stuff with the machine, which has to be calibrated, and you have to make sure everything's going right, and then if something goes wrong, you have to pull the arms out, replace the head, put it back in. There's all kinds of stuff. These technicians are working the entire time uh, along with the machine. Um, so along with that comes a steep learning curve, more time being spent in surgery, more money being spent, therefore, on all of this, and, um, and that 
what, what happens then is that we report, what comes up in the reports is this, um, this, this it looks like maybe the robots um, aren't any better and all they are is just more expensive. Um, but what, what the Stanford doctor said was, well, we're looking at a very new piece of technology oh, from 2000 to 2013. Um, those were people that were learning it. Nobody knew how to use one before 2000 because it didn't exist before 2000. So everybody was learning. Even your most senior surgeons were, were learning on the job with these things. So of course, it was probably worse in the, in the teens um, and, and right, right around the turn of the century than it would be now, right? They, they cautioned, they said, maybe, maybe now it actually, we're gonna actually start seeing some real benefits from this. Okay, so here we get into stuff that's a little more philosophical. So when we're, uh, uh, these are more uh, philosophical concerns about um, uh, robotic surgery. Um, you'll remember that, see these, th see these people right here are, um, here's some surgeons, right? And they're working on somebody, and this is a prototype machine, it isn't actually in use, but you'll notice, where's the patient? Not in that room, right? Not in that room. So where, remember when I said that surgery was this super intimate thing, right? The surgeon has literally got their hands in your body, right? We're, we're now changing that relationship so that the surgeon could be, could be someplace very, very far away from you. We may get to the point in the next few decades where you might not even ever meet your surgeon, right? The surgeon might be somebody very far away. Um, so some of the re some of the ways that uh, robot surgery was initially initially uh, sold was you know ask yourself why did why did I see the early prototypes at SRI in Palo Alto what does SRI do SRI tends to be a research group that gets most of its money from the Department of Defense why do you think the Department of Defense is interested in robotic surgery. What happens to soldiers. They get wounded, right? They get wounded. Uh, are they wounded in a convenient place where you can just pull them right into the hospital? No, they're wounded in places far in the world, right? But, but dangerous, dirty places, right? Is where they get where they get um, where they get wounded. Do you want to send your best surgeons to dangerous, dirty places? No, you don't want to send your surgeons to dangerous, dirty places. It's best if your surgeons are here in Washington, right? And they're working on a soldier in Afghanistan, right, through this technology, right? So that's the reason it was initially developed, was so that we could get extreme distance between the surgeon and the, um, and the patient, right? So, um, so maybe we, it, it turned out that that didn't work. Why, why do you think that didn't work? Um, do, you ever, do you ever lose connection with your internet? What happens if they were doing a heart surgery and, um, and you're, you're, you lost connection with the internet, your surgeon is, 40,000 miles away from you, right? Um, it's, a, it's a bad thing, right? So, um, and even when, if they don't lose, uh, lose connection, um, there can be latent, latency in the signal, which can cause the machine to not operate the way it's meant to operate. So it turned out that, that we couldn't really uh, distance the surgeon too far. Right now, the, the surgeon is just like five feet away from you, um, because that turns out to be sort of the optimum. Um, but we're working on that technology, and that, that technology is changing every day, and we're, we're extending the distance between the patient and the, um, and the, uh, the surgeon. Um, another thing is autonomy. So this is just a practice machine. But may, uh, imagine, imagine uh, now we're going to distance the surgeon so far away from you that the surgeon isn't actually going to be present at all ever. It's just the machine that you're going to interact with. So you'll just put you on a conveyor belt, and you'll run into the room, and then, then the machine will do the cataract surgery or whatever on your eye, and then you'll go out the other side, and another patient will come in right afterward, do another cataract surgery, right? And you'll just be like on a conveyor belt, right? And there will be no surgeon involved. The machine will just be programmed to do the surgery. That would be complete autonomous surgeon. So currently, we don't have machines much like that. I'll show you here in a moment. We do have some interestingly fully autonomous machines in medicine, um, but the, the desire is to move more and more of that there, because surgeons are expensive people to hire, 
Um, it, uh, we may, uh, people who own hospitals may be able to see a huge savings if they don't have to hire surgeons at all, like, or maybe you hire just two surgeons for the entire system, and, um, and robots are doing most of the work, right? And then we have to worry about reverse adaptation, right? So here, here uh, and maybe we'll get to the future where just like, um, just like you have your own printer, and maybe you have your own 3D printer now. Maybe you'll have your own your own surgery box, right? And you'll just do the surgery at home, right? Or you'll rent it from Best Buy, and a, and, a, and a tech geek will show up and set it up, and then they'll do brain surgery in your house. Um, I don't know. That's a weird world, but not an inconceivable world. Okay. So. Um, Here's uh, uh, something that I started thinking about. So I, I built this little table, and uh, I put two factors on it, right, from uh, fully human-controlled machines to fully autonomous machines, and then machines where you have very little human contact, and then machines where you have, um, uh, uh, the human. I mean, sorry, machines are humans that are in direct contact with your body. And so we looked at, uh, what's available right now. So these are machines that, that you can, that you can uh, interact with right now, and they're placed on this table. So the one that is most common is this Da Vinci machine, and it is not autonomous at all. It, does, it is fully controlled by a human who's operating all of those lines. I know it sort of looks like a robot, but it's not. It's a, it's a tele-operated machine. Um, there's, there, it's not making any decisions on its own. Humans make every decision before it does anything. Um, an interesting example of a fully autonomous m medical machine is this CT scanner. I don't know if you've had a CT scan before, um, but this, is the, this machine is so autonomous that um, uh, when you go into the room, uh, there's just a technician there. There's no, there's no doctors in the room. They don't need a doctor. This machine does everything a doctor would do all by itself. And they just put you on the table, and then the machine just does its whole thing. It goes in, uh, does the, does the uh, scan. It even talks to you, right? The machine itself talks to you. It says, hold your breath, <laughs> breathe, right? And, um, and it just does, it does everything all by itself. It's a really fantastic, interesting machine. So that's an example of fully autonomous, very little contact. The machine doesn't touch you. People don't touch you. Um, it's just a, a, a kind of feels like magic when you have it done. Um, these things are, um, uh, um, I can't remember which one of these is, is one of these is a bone milling machine. So um, if you have a surgery where they have to grind down some bone, that's sort of tedious uh, a job, and they have a machine that they will just start it grinding the bone down, and then they don't have to watch it. It, it does it by itself. Um, and then <clears throat> over here, would be um, future machines, possibly, right? These would be machines that are autonomous, like the, the CT scanner, but um, that have direct contact, like the Da Vinci machine. So you just imagine kind of marrying these two machines together, and that would be a machine that could do like an open heart surgery on you without any human uh, interaction. <coughs> these machines we should never develop. They are, um, they, it's just a human control with little contact. I don't even know what they would be. So that's just kind of a, a blank area. Okay, so let's get through this really quick. This is kind of the punchline. When is it best to trust robotic surgery, right? Um, when, are, uh, when are we doing the right thing by making the choice to do this kind of surgery, right? So we have to ask ourselves these, these I think these questions initially are important. Um, it's all about uh, telesurgery right now. These things do increase the distance between the surgeon and the patient. That is something that has to be addressed. Um, latency and risk is really an important thing. Um, how, how are we going to be able to get these things to work? One of the things they want to be able to do, this is really crazy, but if you think about it, imagine you're an astronaut on your way to Mars, you need a surgery. Um, we didn't take a surgeon with us, right? How do you get that surgery done? We're going to have one of these Da Vinci machines on the spaceship, and you're going to get the surgeon on Earth is going to uh, try to do a surgery, you know, close to Mars, right? 
um, how are we going to deal with the latency and risk in those situations? Um, and then just the, you know, the fact that these things are frightening looking. I spend all my time thinking about these machines. I'm still scared as hell of this thing. I hope when they wheel me in, I'm already knocked out. I don't even want to see it. Um, you know, just really uh, the most, I mean, they, they look exactly like that evil machine in Star Wars that, uh, that um, tortures Princess Leia. <laughs> Okay, so we are now kind of at the end. Let's see, I'm going to skip over that and talk about this for our last minute. So, um, so what, are, what, are, what should we be concerned about? Um, uh, we have to remember that operation time is up, recovery time is lower, so we have this weird kind of cost-benefit analysis we have to worry about right now with the technologies we have in the hospitals right now. Uh, we have to work on trying to cross that digital divide. How are we going to make these things uh, cost efficient so that we can take what we learn, uh, new, new positive uh, strategies, and, and give them to the rest of the world as well? Uh, we have to make sure that profit seeking isn't the thing that's motivating this. We're actually doing it because it's better for patients, not because it's uh, more uh, lucrative for surgeons. Um, and then future sur surgery uh, ethics that are going to have to think about. Surgeons are going to soon, very soon, have to make this decision. Like um, uh, right now, we can give you sort of replacements of, of your arm. As these replacements get better, surgeons are going to have to make this decision. Patients are going to come into them and say, get rid of my arm. I'm tired of it. It's, there's nothing wrong with it, but I just want a robot arm, right? Because robot arms are better. And I want the eye arm. Right? And I want you to install the eye arm or the eye eye right, in my head. Um, surgeons are going to have to make those decisions uh, based on, uh, it's, like, it's like cosmetic surgery, right? but, but in, in a really super weird way. Um, same thing with surgical enhancements. And then when we get to the point of fully autonomous surgery machines, are we going to admit those machines into the, the um, are we going to treat them like, like we treat surgeons? Are, is, surgeon, are, is the art of surgery going to be something that becomes so de-skilled that we don't, even, uh, we don't even give them any social benefit? Right now, you'd be really impressed. If I told you I was a surgeon, you'd be really impressed. You'd buy me a drink. In the future, you might not care because that job is like lower than a technician, right? Because the, all the skill is in the machine, not in the surgeon themselves, right? So those are the ethical things to think about in surgery. Uh, hopefully it gives you something to think about, and I'll talk to you guys uh, not next week, but the week after. Thank you.